Rangina ma'am, welcome to Izhare Rat. And last but not the least, we have with us Padma Shri Shrimati Geeta Chandran ji. A polymath artist, Geeta Chandran is celebrated not only for her deep and composite understanding for the art of Bharatanatyam, but also for her carnatic music, television, theater, choreography, dance education, and activism, and her work in dance journalism. She has earned a number of prestigious awards, including the Lady Sri Ram College Illustrious Alumna Award, the Guru Deva Prasad Das Award, the Bharat Nirman Award, the Indra Priyadarshini Award, the National Critics Award, to name a few. She is the founder, president, and the artistic director of Natya Rikshas Dance Academy. But beyond her unique role as a prominent classical dancer, she has continually tried to push the boundaries of classical art and reach out to new audiences, especially the young ones. She believes that dance must be connected to life and the artists must make a difference to life using their unique place in society. She has collaborated with a wide range of performers, singers, craftspeople, writers, in extending the frontiers of a classical dance performances. We graciously thank you all for your benign presence and extend our welcome and invite you to present us with your wonderful insights on the poetry of body and the politics of dance. Thank you. But oh, alas, so long, so far. Our bodies, why do we forbear? They are ours, though they are not we. We are the intelligences. They are spheres. Welcome to Izhari Raks once again. I would like to extend my heartful thanks to all the our panelists who agreed to, to, be, uh, to be with us today. Before we get down to the subject at hand, that is poetry of body and politics of dance, let's get an insight about your journeys, by which I don't really mean your formal journey, but also the intellectual journey. A brief about your background and your formative influences that made you who you are today, and not only as dancers, but also as a person. Starting with Atiti ma'am, all over to you ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Yes ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for having me here and uh, sharing my views with all of you um, and wonderful uh, Geeta and where are you Ranjana? Yeah, <laughs> wonderful to share this panel with you. Well, you know, I was really lucky to be born into a very liberal family. Um, it was not liberal for the time, it was liberal in the sense that um, we, I, we were encouraged to discuss, to de debate, to disagree. We were encouraged to read the scriptures, but it was, it was not as if they were carved in stone. We were encouraged to agree or disagree with them. And if we did, we were encouraged to debate this. And I think that really helped me because it, it sort of, um, if your loved ones around you are non-judgmental, and it gives you uh, the confidence for risk taking, you know, and, and that was where, how my journey began. Enhanced by the two amazing gurus that I had in, um, that I, I still, I mean, I'm under, Kumudini Lakhyaji, who encouraged us not to wear blinkers. So though our rehearsal and our practice was steeped in the classical tradition of Kathak. We were encouraged not to wear blinkers. We were encouraged to live life and let, let that resonance permeate within us. With my Guru Pandit Maharaji, Birju Maharaji, who is the torchbearer of the Lucknow Gharana, who represents tradition. It was about look at him and his observation in the moment. It's amazing how dance bursts forth from him 
in the moment, observation of the moment. So I think that is very important to have dance and life not um, separate from each other. Because I think your life and your art are simultaneously growing together. Very early in my life, I asked myself, what are my priorities? And it is me as a human being, then me as a dancer, and then me as a Kathak dancer, because we are talking about dance. So I asked myself, I remember in the late 80s, there was this urgent need for me to dance claustrophobia. I don't know, it was something in my, in my life, something that it was a creative impulse and a compulsion. And hard as I've tried, I was not able to dance it fully within the broader parameters of Kathak that I had learned or that were, that were available to me. Me, somebody else can do it. This is about me. So there are three questions that, that, faced, that I was faced with. One was, do I say no to this creative impulse? You know, but I find that my human mind takes precedent over my Kathak mind and my Kathak body and my Kathak emotions. Or do I compromise and say, well, you know, it's not the best way that I can communicate, but it would be blasphemous if I did not do it within the broader parameters of Kathak. Or do I tell myself, no, I am living claustrophobia right now. My truth and my honesty is to reflect through my dance the best I can of about claustrophobia, which could mean that I needed to absorb within my body things that may fall outside of the broader Kathak parameter. So to end, that journey started, I'm still on a journey. 80% of my work is within the broader parameters of Kathak. I learned Kathak, I teach Kathak, my dance company is Kathak. Um, my, uh, who, uh, the, the people I interact with within the dance fraternity are very often my collaborators fall within the Kathak parameter. So it's like, it's like uh, sowing a seed of Kathak and watering it with my life experiences, my guru's teachings, my observations of all the great gurus and practitioners of Kathak that have lived and let that Kathak tree grow. But at the same time, I also reserve a right and I do plant a seed of Kathak. So your voice and and your picture should water work. it with contemporary sensibility, contemporary movement possibilities. Yeah. Contemporary yeah. So the tree that grows out of it is because of the lack of a word, I call contemporary dance based on Kathak. So that's basically been a journey um, Actually, of me as a person and as a human being because I don't separate dance and my humanity and my person as two different entities. Thanks. That's really inspiring, ma'am. And the way you don't let dance and life separate is really, really enriching and a thought-provoking thing. Uh, next, we like... Geeta Chandran ma'am to please tell us something uh, regarding your background and your formative influences. Uh, I'd like to keep this short because uh, I think we need to take many, many things as we go on. Um, I could say that I'm just the opposite of Aditi. I came from an extremely conservative house, extremely conservative family. Nobody had taken dance or music as a profession. And um, everybody was into becoming doctors, lawyers and engineers. Everybody was in IITs and in um, all kinds of spaces. Uh, but 
his master's voice was what I grew up with in the house. Early in the morning, my father would chant and then his master's voice would take over the house with all the greats playing music. You know, music was really the lifeline of our entire family, identifying ragas, trying to identify composers, identifying other uh, compositions in the same raga. This was all the kind of, we didn't have play Antakshari, but we played these kinds of games of um, knowing how much you knew in the music field. Um, I'm an only child, so my mother's focus, my mother was a homemaker, uh, and uh, her focus was on me. And she, all that was denied to her, she wanted me to pick up in terms of skills, music, dance. These were the two main things. And of course, academia was very important in our family. You couldn't get away from it. Um, so uh, uh, that was very important too. So it was a very structured kind of an upbringing. Uh, we had to get up in the morning, practice music, go to school, come back and finish your homework quickly and then go to one class or the other every day. And it's not like this like now where you have weekend classes etc no no classes meant going at a, at a certain time and no no time of coming back it was like a whole evening committed to uh, learning observing dialoguing you know it was a kind of a long um, engagement with what you did um, so uh, my first teacher was Srimati Swarna Saraswati who was from the Isai Vellar community and um, she came to Delhi. I was very fortunate to get that old classical dance training from uh, her because um, it was as authentic as you could get at that time. I think authentic is a very, very dangerous word today. However, uh, she learned it in Tanjavur from great teachers, right? From Gauri Amal was her Abhinaya teacher and um, she had great names associated with her. She could play the veena, give a con concert in the Saraswati veena. She could sing. She was a Tiger Varadachari student. So every class was um, an insight into, into music, into languages because she was a linguist as well. So I think the bar was raised. You know, uh, we never thought that you could become a dancer if you didn't, if you, if, if you didn't, if, if you don't know music, if you don't know languages, if you can't compose a certain sequence. So I think all this was part of the learning process. So it was an engagement. I now, when I look back, was very intense. But as a child, I was kind of very much enjoying it. There was never a force. But my mother was um, um, the, the guiding force in my life because um, uh, I, uh, Really, really sorry for the disturbance. I'm really sorry. I used to come back a certain day and say that, oh, my legs are hurting. I don't want to go back and things like that. And she would listen, listen, listen to the whole thing and then pack my bags promptly the next class and say, okay, so um, uh, there were no, there was actually no choice. <laughs> we are really sorry for the disturbance, ma'am. Just a second. You should start dancing. <laughs> ooh, ooh. So um, I think the that was my first engagement, and suddenly. Oh, it's literally the Bangladesh. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, formal education was going full on, full swing. And um, I, before I realized, I was performing, I was traveling, and um, I went on to my next teacher, uh, Guru K. and Dakshinamurti, who was completely opposite to my first teacher. Uh, my first teacher believed in dance being. Um, a way of expressing yourself as seva to the divine, etc. But here came Dakshinamurti sir, who was all about performance. So he got me into the performance mold. And I learned a lot of the performance skills from Dakshinamurti sir. And the other teacher that I was very fortunate to engage with, with was Kalanidhi Mami through Jamuna Krishnan, who was my teacher in Abhinaya.
So all these inputs were going on simultaneously and being pumped in and uh, my head was like reeling with ideas, with uh, um, you know, technique, uh, with possibilities in dance. And then I landed up in Lady Sri Ram College where I did mathematical statistics. And those three years really gave me time to think as to what I should be doing. Um, and certainly I decided I'm not going to do maths for sure. That was decided. One thing out of the way. And then I did my master's in uh, Indian Institute of Mass Communications in communication. And that's when I realized the possibility of using dance as a communication tool and what is possible with it. And um, uh, then, of course, I think it's, uh, uh, I've been fortunate because um, while going into the deep of the classical, enjoying it immensely, as Aditi said, I also enjoyed pushing the frontiers and seeing what happens to the style when you juxtapose it with other forms of expression, when you put it with puppetry, when you put it with other forms of music, when you juxtapose it with visual artists. I was very fortunate to work with a lot of people, though at that time, uh, I never thought I took risks, as Aditi rightly said. We all took risks. We were not bothered about if we did the collaboration, will I lose a solo performance in a, a performance slot? We never thought like that. I think we, we went, followed the heart. And if we found a project very engaging, you just did it. So, you know, it was not so much of thinking. So also viewing dance in different ways, viewing dance not merely as entertainment, but dance as part of intellectual discourse, uh, dance as part of social, social reaction. I wouldn't say change because that's a very big word, uh, but to react to a certain issue that is close to your heart. And also, I think to engage with, as I said, other creative processes. So these were uh, interesting for me. And this was all in the 1990s where Kumudini Ji was doing her bit and there was Chandra uh, doing her bit. And we were all exposed to a lot of debate, discourse as to what is happening to dance, what is happening to the body. All this was happening. And the churning was within you uh, as to uh, whether to stay within the confines of your own um, tradition that has been taught you in a certain way how could that be uh, taken to the next level of experience and make it your own, make it your own statement, make dance your own. And as uh, we all realize that there was not a single moment in the day when you didn't think about dance. You were either thinking dance, eating dance, sleeping dance at that time, you know, and engaging with it. So dance was life. There was no classroom time and outside classroom time or studio time outside studio time. And we watched a lot. I thought we, we, had, we didn't have the click of the button and we could watch everything. We had to go to the theater and watch. Yes, and the there. experience of watching things in theater it is amazing and it leaves an impact, you know, which is lasting. I can remember of, of certain programs that have stayed with me, certain costumes, designs, sets, everything, even international productions, because we were in, in, in Delhi, we had the, the good fortune of getting a lot of international companies performing here and all those influences, I think we took in. And uh, I want to... I wanted to speak less, but I've already spoken too much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I would like Ranjana, ma'am, to uh, give some insights. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. It was very inspiring to listen to both Aditi and Gita and to understand uh, their intellectual journeys. And, uh, and I was just thinking, I mean, they were both speaking of the 80s and 90s as these moments. And, uh, and these are literally moments I've experienced as a toddler because I was born in the late 80s. Um, and uh, I, I, I mean, I did not, uh, I was born in Bombay to a sort of very, in a very squarely middle class family. I did not... Um, necessarily have much music or dance in my life. It was just what I encountered in school, the uh, annual, an annual day function, that sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, and, and I think that was also because, uh, again, uh, I mean, like most, 
urban uh, middle class aspiration the idea was that i would be a doctor or an engineer and the focus was always on that but um, but somewhere because there wasn't really any focus on the arts or on literature or on other things i was also able to form my own opinions because there were no opinions that existed for me to uh, strong opinions for me to reference so uh, so much of sort of what i imbibed was what i read i i, I read a lot as a child and uh, and also because my again my parents there was no structured history of reading uh, in the house so they were extremely unconcerned about what i read and that uh, sort of and at 8 or 9 i was already reading things that i probably shouldn't have looked at before i was of uh, before i was an adult uh, but uh, but that also really let me form my own opinions and revisit them from time to time and uh, it reminded me from a very early age that nothing nothing is set in stone and everything can change and it's just uh it's just where you are at at a particular moment and what your frameworks are and uh, also what you identify with so so it really uh, my upbringing in that way taught me to keep the individual uh, and to keep uh, my thinking as central to whatever i uh, engaged with uh, not not in an extremely indulgent the person is king way but also to recognize that even within a system i could have uh, my own identity um and uh, i studied journalism as uh, uh, when i was uh, your age actually when i was an uh, uh, undergrad student and um and uh, i studied journalism parallel to beginning to study dance because i i'd always wanted to dance as a child but my parents thought uh, i should be studying uh, studying as in mainstream uh, education medical engineering that sort of thing so i uh, so i never really had the opportunity to experience dance uh, that much um and and i always thought that uh, you know journalism or anything else i did uh, within mainstream education was really just a stopgap measure to keep my parents happy but uh, eventually i realized that uh, for me dance and uh writing which is what my journalism training led me to really go hand in hand and uh as of now they've culminated in an interest in body and text uh i studied odissi as uh, 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 uh at that time and i still do and um and i mean i studied odissi that i went went on to work with I, i'm just going to sort of maybe go through some key uh, moments i one of the first things i did out of uh, university after i was at jnu for two years uh, was uh, work on this work on creating an online archive of uh, dance and uh, what we did was actually archive a whole set of classical dance videos and uh, and in the conversations we had with uh, so what we do is we find a video and then we annotate it so say if, if it was a composition from the geet govin we'd sit down with a dancer we'd uh, talk to them about the meaning of the song but also talk to them about their experience of performing the song and uh, and where in some cases it was also how the song was choreographed by uh, by them or by their teachers so so that really and uh, from that moment onwards and that happened pretty early i was able to see how uh, classical dance is not just it's not just these steps these songs we learn this all but how it's actually a question of people at certain moments in time seeing something and making certain artistic decisions um and uh, and i feel like this sort of fluidity moves both between the body and the text in how in how you compose really so so now i've begun to see and i and i feel like i'm still in a st i'm still at a point where i'm very confused about what i'm doing and i possibly uh uh i'm constantly wondering uh whether what i do has any meaning but uh i've also as i grow older i've begun to hold on to uh uh remembering that uh, the moment i feel like i know everything and i understand everything 
that's actually a very that's that's probably a very complacent state to be in and that's actually uh, where, when you begin to stagnate so i feel like i'm it it's very hard to get used to this uncertainty but i'm enjoying uh, not knowing and enjoying knowing that things are always going to change yeah that's all for now thank you so much ma'am and as you said that continuous it's a continuous process and enjoying what whatever we are doing right now so but basically just moving on to my first question uh, dance usually gets related to the idea of postures or graceful movements and even body curves so can we infer from this that uh, there is a pressure to conform to these ideas of body which are regarded as ideal uh, by the society and does this pressure of idealism sometimes constrain a dancer to express themselves fully so what are your insights regarding that starting with geeta ma'am well um, i must confess that uh, i have never been lead thin or uh, uh, the exact kind of uh, zero figure ever but uh, um, but uh, uh, i i feel that dance um, is something that has to transcend the body and it has to be a felt kind of uh, uh, you know from where the movement stems and what is the connection that you make with the movement it's very it's a process you know i mean um, it 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 Uh, and i think the pedagogy that you've gone through and how you have learned it also makes a huge difference and i have been teaching for many years now and no one movement that you teach in a class the moment you teach it looks good on everybody no it has to be customized it has to be worked over and over again on each of the bodies and see where is that aesthetic connection being made by that by that body with that movement so uh, fat thin has no place in this i have had uh, rather heavy dancers who are the most flexible and who are so endearing as dancers and they are fantastic communicators and at the same time a perfect body can be so unengaging i tell you it can be so uh, non responsive to a movement so i really don't believe in um, in what uh, the way a body uh, is shaped or it's the soul that is dancing it is your involvement it is your connection it is what you what you say um from the core of your heart and that's what touches a, a person that's what engages a viewer and that's what moves a viewer because dance has to move dance has to uh, to 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 move you to a space where you didn't know that that existed within and that has for that i don't think it's it's technique it's not technique it's not body it's something else which is very intangible and you have it and the teacher has to to flag that fire in you and you have to work very hard to get there so i think um, i i have seen fabulous dancers do you know and i forget that they look a certain way i only look at what they are saying and how they are saying and how effective it is so i seriously am one who believes that size doesn't matter color doesn't matter shade doesn't matter it's how you say it and with what intensity you say it and with what conviction you say it that's really insightful ma'am uh, aditi ji um for me i don't there is no ideal body and when i talk about the dancing body it's a biological entity that is to do with the physical body the emotional landscape and the mind right so i would rather talk about this biological entity which is a healthy entity 
a fit entity. I do believe that just as important as your physical health or fitness is important to dance, it's just as important for your mind to be supple, for your mind to be flexible and, in, uh, and engage in dexterity. It's equally important for your emotions to have vulnerability. I loved what Ranjana said because I like to be in a place of doubt myself, you know, because that is what will keep you, keep you exploring. And that is what I think this sense of where there is a fitness of the mind, of the body, and of the emotional landscape. Because that is what dance to me is that biological entity. I, I also want to bring in age. Um, I'm, I'm 60 and I ask myself, how does ageism come into dance? You know, and you are all, uh, I, you are all God knows what in your late uh, teens or early twenties or, you know, and to me, it is a fit mind, body, and, and emotions, of course. But it is also about not losing the wonder of life. Not becoming stuck in the experiences that you have gathered. Because an older person has obviously gathered many experiences. And you become stuck in that route. You become as if you know it all. And that is more of an aging body mm -hmm. than an actually chronologically aging body. So I came across just today, in fact, um, this beautiful saying by Pema Chodron, and I'm going to read it out. In each new moment, one lifetime ends and another begins. So for me, an ideal body is which, in which one is prepared to die at every moment for something new to be created every moment through your mind, through your emotional landscape, and of course, through the physical body. Having said that, I do feel that at some place you need to have an instrument that is tuned. And therefore it is very important that physically, because overweight is not a healthy place to be. I don't mean read thin, but I mean healthy. Similarly for your heart. You know, if you're full of negative emotions, it's not a healthy place where you can communicate openly. Or, or a healthy mind. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ranjana, ma'am, what's your perspective regarding that? Um, I agree with a lot of things that have already been said by uh, Aditi and Gita. And, um, and somewhere, I mean, I agree that dance is not, um, when dance is just, look at the history of uh, any dance form. The dance is passing through so many different bodies as it's taught from generation to generation. You have uh, different kinds of like people at different ages, people of different genders, uh, people from in, at different sort of, you know, um, of, at different places in society um, uh, in terms of geography, training and then maybe disseminating that training to someone else. So uh, any, uh, any dance form that is taught is already passed through so many bodies that uh, it doesn't have to be restricted to a single uh, uh, one kind of body. I agree that, I mean, it, the question is, it is a healthy, I mean, you have a healthy body. You have a body that's uh, uh, able to engage with that information to the best capacity possible. That, that is what is necessary. But what I think what often happens is that um, uh, expectations from society also begin to inform what the ideal body looks like at a certain time. 
So, uh, for instance, even in classical dance, if you uh, look at dancers, say, uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, at the dancers that populated this, you know, the most, uh, like, the people you found in newspapers and the general uh, visual landscape of a dance form, they looked, they had very different body types from the ones we now see on Instagram all the time. And, uh, and I mean, the question is also, what are you like, I think Gita said it, what are you saying with it? It's not, uh, it's not, uh, there's so much on Instagram. There are so many dancers uh, executing perfect jatis uh, every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. But what stays with you from that uh, experience of viewing and also from their experience of embodying that dance? Uh, I just wanted to return to what I was saying about society earlier. For uh, instance, as uh, whenever I had to do my Odissi makeup for a very long time, uh, I, I could never find, there are about two pancake shades, the last two pancake shades in the whole range of uh, makeup that's available that worked for my complexion. And, uh, and even with those shades, the idea really for those was to make, uh, make me look fairer. There was nothing that actually naturally suited my complexion. Uh, and for a very long time, I mean, I hated how I looked on stage because I, it was it was all cakey. It was not my skin color at all, and it really made me feel unnatural. And that was that was not an expectation that came from the dance necessarily. The Odyssey wasn't telling me this is how you should look on stage, but those were the options available to me uh, in society. And in like in the sort of condition of having to perform and having to wear makeup while performing, I just had to end up looking like that until I was able to find uh, and afford makeup that uh, looked more like my skin color. Just a small example. Also, uh, I'd like to add that, you know, um, also challenging the body as you grow uh, older is important because you know bodies do get into a very complacent classical dance mold so it was interesting when i had to do kaikei which was all, which was trying to address stigma i had to work with rashid who was a movement expert and i had to do tai chi and i had to do a lot of other forms i realized how my spine was so conditioned to bharatanatyam and how the body doesn't allow you or easily break away from a certain uh, mold that you're pushed into. Um, for so many years, your spine has been a certain way, you look a certain way and you behave a certain way. So I, I love to challenge the body and you know, kind of do things which are completely, that's why I like to do Bhangra at times because it just loosens you up, you know? and. Um, we have a lot of fun in the studio because I think the classical, also the classical dancer takes herself, her, himself very seriously. So I think we need to loosen up as, uh, also. So I feel the body has great capacity to adapt, to push and to, to, to explore. So I think as classical dancers, we need to be more experimental and explore, you know, and um, not get boxed in. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really thought provoking. Uh, moving on to the next uh, question. Dance, especially in India, has always been linked to national identity or even unique culture and religion or spiritual superiority. But we also see uh, that it is not untouched by sexuality or other expressions of desire. So do you think that upholding a certain image just uh, hinders this process of expressing some deep emotions that a dancer can express? Who do you want? Who's? Ma'am, anyone, like uh, whatever comforts you and whatever insights you want to give us. You know, um, sexuality is a very, very uh, taboo subject. And I think we need to talk about it. Um, and somehow it seems, in fact, my new production, uh, which was to be premiered in November this year, but now it's happening in, in October 2021, is called Forbidden. And it asks, the, explores the question, why is the world scared of female sexual fantasy? Why? 
you know and this what is it that will be unleashed what are the forces that for centuries through poetry and painting and 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 through our uh, literature this sort of stereotypical thing has been reinforced a kind of celebration of the male gaze of the sexuality of women rather than a female celebration of her own sexuality and i think this is a conversation we need to have in india very very much because why is it that the world over you know we can't own our own sexuality what is what is it that is taboo why is it considered you know when women talk about uh, sexual fantasy why not you know so this work of mine um, what are my entry points my entry points are what um, popular narratives that i grew up with popular narratives that we've all probably grown up with and these popular narratives in an insidious way keep on reinforcing within us this thought of how um how in case a woman dares to own her own sexuality something terrible will befall her i mean look at lakshman rekha look at agni pariksha look at ahalya look at surpanakha so what is it what is it that the world is scared of that will be shaken if women talk about sex if classical dancers don't pander to a male gaze get a male gaze of sexuality but are own their sexuality on stage you know and i think that's a very important conversation to have i may add that in kathak you look at the repertoire of kathak and i talk about kathak because that's my field of of well, that's um look at this con the whole repertoire called chhed chhad you know today we talk about no means yes but this has come and practitioners have danced it and i have danced it what are we saying what is you know we have to be very careful because sometimes you get mesmerized by the beauty of the dance some of our great gurus have danced it in the most beautiful way you get taken away by the melody and the and the beautiful stringing together of the thumri but what is that word what is that image telling you it is saying no is yes it is constantly reinforcing this and and it was very late in my career i mean in 2010 i did a production when this whole thing was part of it and when i look back i said hey didn't i think why why and also this whole whole concept of um, uh, you know what is tandav what is glass why is tandav yes kathak solo artists do the male do the female do all uh, you know we um, but why is the masculine the strong the heroic the 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 valor and why is the feminine the the beauty and the grace why why can't we cross fertilize this if you ask me to forget all narratives and you say show me a woman and no words my first thing will be this or it will be anna or it will be when why it's about ghungat about narratives about about adornment if you show a man mustache strutting about you know masculine why these are stereotypical images and which only get surmounted if you become a god or a goddess so yes if you are a goddess you may have all these different qualities but no what about you as a woman me as a woman even you as a man 
Why cannot a man cry? Why cannot he be gentle? Why are stereotypical things, why are certain uh, dance things in the, in the West where the man leads and the woman follows? I mean, now they are turned on their heads. Why is in classical dance that we, though we dance both, our imagery is so stereotypical. And that is a very important thing about talking about sexuality. Because if, we, if women don't own their own bodies and everything that goes with that, then where are we as a society? Thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am. I hope things will change and sex will not be a taboo in coming years. Uh, Ranjana, ma'am. I resonate so much with what Aditi just said. And, uh, and I think it's especially important for us to reflect on this, um, given the moment we're just living through in the news with the Hathras uh, rape case. Um, and uh, I mean, I'll start with what she uh, touched on in the end, which is to say that the moment, uh, because there is, a, there is an overlap between, uh, our, between our source material, especially in classical dance and uh, religion, uh, what often happens is that uh, uh, all the narratives that we play out get consolidated as this is reality, this is what happened. And, uh, and I think as dancers, it's important for us to remember and to know that we, uh, we should be treating them as narratives, they're stories. And, uh, and those stories will also, I mean, they will change with time. So some stories like Chechar, for instance, uh, Maybe in this moment, it's important for us to reconsider that uh, these are not ideal behaviors, that these are not behaviors that we should be uh, promoting necessarily. And, uh, and I feel like much of what happens la last year, I read this very interesting piece uh, on uh, the poetry of Shetraya, uh, which suggested that Shetraya was not a single male poet but was actually a series of people and possibly many women as well uh, who all wrote poetry. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very enamored by uh, all the erotic poetry that we perform in dance, but uh, somewhere I, I always remember that all of it is uh, presented to us as the woman viewed through the male gaze. Uh, what what is it about like why uh, like Aditi asked why are we unwilling to uh, confront I mean say that I have desires and I would like to uh, embody and talk about those desires and and there is a very clear way in which that uh, uh, refusal to engage with uh, female sexuality also carries over into society. Like when, uh, say, court rolling say, oh, but you know, she asked for it because she was dressed that way. That's exactly what they're suggesting, that the moment a female body or a, the moment a non sort of male body actually, not just a female body, uh, a non cis male body begins to say that uh, uh, you know, I have desires, that is problematic for society. So, uh, so I feel like, uh, oh, there was something else that I wanted to touch on, but I can't remember at this moment. But, but yes, definitely we need to, we need to think, keep thinking about what we're doing uh, as dancers, the narratives we're sourcing on as dancers and uh, keep reflecting on them as we go on. Thank yes, you so much. I think uh, a lot has been said and um, we do come from a society of binaries and we've all been part of this uh, uh, growing up in a certain way and um, the content primarily, particularly in Bharatanatyam is uh, written by male poets. Most of it is written by male poets and uh, you really have to look for female poetry and as a student of dance, I think you learn the technique, you learn many pieces. And then as you evolve as a person, as you see society around you, I think you make certain choices. Even in terms of what you do and what you reject and what you arrive at on stage reflects your 
personal uh, thinking process, your your uh, frame of reference, and your how you're positioning yourself. So I think today we must make pedagogy so rich that a critical thinking has to be built into the pedagogy of dance teaching. Because, you know, dance teaching is not just the technique. Unfortunately, it's just not moving of your hands and legs and learning items. I'm so pained that in social media, you're actually only teaching material. You're only teaching uh, how to dance. You're not thinking, you're not making dancers engage. You're not making them realize that they, they are in a society ridden with problems. So I feel the problem is in the pedagogy of dance. I think that is, we, we need to address that. We can't just talk about, uh, you know, performers after they're already well formed, shaped, and the thinking is closed. So I feel uh, it's very important in our education system, in our teaching of dance, to really think, to think about body, to think about gender, to think about issues, to think about sexuality, and what works for one need not work for the other. What is your take and what is your positioning? I think is so important when you come uh, to a certain space. And um, uh, it's interesting because um, I had two students who, uh, by choice, decided to. Um, uh, go through a sex change and I realized that the, the how the body was trapped in a in a certain um, uh, uh, you know mold and how they wanted to so I was part of that process and I've seen that and of course one is a very well-known dancer now in the US and the other one it worries me because he's from a social strata which is not so affluent and I remember when she came to the class after the change I could see the, the, the children, you know, around. I just left. I just wanted them to observe and just be very natural. And today I see the, they've just embraced her so beautifully. So I think it's how you treat a certain situation, how you react to a certain situation. And, and we are only talking about artists here. What about the audience? I think the, the, the problem comes from the audience always being conditioned to seeing a certain thing in a certain way. And we need to also work on the audience. You see, audience have to be more demanding of the artist. And they need to also from their side kind of change and ask for change. So change cannot happen only from one side. I think change has to come from the other side also. So discerning audience wanting a work which makes them think, which makes them uncomfortable. Because many times I have, in my work of Gandhi, there is manual scavenging. I have seen people walk out, they can't even see that on stage. Now that's making them uncomfortable. I think it's a success. I feel your walking out is, is my reward. That you, it's made you uncomfortable, you're walking out, very good. So I think you need to do work which, which you know, makes people, wake up and just think. Thank you so much, ma'am. As almost all our panelists have talked about uh, expression of something unconventional, and uh, dance has also evolved in India a lot, like since pre-independence period to today. What are your insights regarding the mingling of various dance forms and even uh, dance as an expression of contemporary issues? Like it has mingled with uh, contemporary and uh, expression through dance. We see a lot of heteronormativity in India also. But through dance, homosexuality has also uh, got uh, expression, like we change roles and uh, we switch roles during the performance. What are your insights regarding that? Um, I could uh, start. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, I uh, I'm just actually I'm just going back to your question. Just a second. Um, so I remember that in your uh, in the questions that you'd sent us before, you'd also spoken of dance as an expression of uh, 
feelings and freedom and of, uh, that leads to spirit that leads to spiritual and emotional stability and um, and i was and i and that reading that i remember made me think that um, when we say dance as expression uh, it yes it is i mean yes it is uh, you know dance uh, as personal expression it is dance that serves a purpose a certain artistic say you know uh, in making a work but it's also it's also what dance says to society and how dance responds to society i uh, I, for one, strongly believe that dance uh, is political because uh, the way the way it is structured at any given time is really the, even the decisions, even how it's structured, even uh, what the building blocks of a dance are, how it is taught, uh, how it is performed, and uh, what the sort of subjects of his performance are. They're all connected to what's happening in society. Nothing, it's not happening um, in an independent bubble. I'm saying this because I also recently uh, did an interview for this online um, channel where a lot of people, where I said something similar and a lot of people said, oh, but dance is, you know, dance is divine, dance is artistic. It has nothing to do with politics. It's pure, we should keep it away from society. That's... Uh, I feel like that that actually restricts that also restricts the uh, it restricts what dance can do and it also restricts whom dance can who who is able to dance and uh, whom it can reach out to uh, and I think a huge I mean with um, uh, especially teaching students uh, who are mostly your age uh, in many cases I've also seen that there's this huge alienation from uh, classical dance. Uh, because that's how it's always been presented to them. They've never had easy access to it. They've, uh, and whenever it, it has been presented to them, it's al always, uh, uh, you know, presented as something that's beyond, uh, beyond their understanding, beyond their, uh, beyond their access, something that they can't, you know, uh, can't reach out to really. So I feel like it's, it's important to it's important for people to be one able to access dance easily and also to be able to partake of it easily and uh, as a corollary to that it's very important for dance to be uh, to be speaking about contemporary issues and and those may vary so ho maybe homosexuality is one thing the political situation is another thing and uh, in recent protests we've seen how uh, the arts have been used to protest uh, and 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 there is also a significant crackdown on the arts because they've been used to protest and uh, and that should actually remind us and gesture to the fact that the arts are so powerful as a medium uh, that uh, that they're constantly under threat so, so really, so what we should be doing is using that power very, very mindfully and very proactively because they are powerful. Everyone knows that. And the moment we begin to say, oh, dance, you know, dance is separate from everything else. We're putting it into a box. We actually take that agency, that power away from dance. Um, I couldn't agree more, Ranjana. But uh, the fact is that um, uh, the established institutions of dance and the established presenters of dance don't think this way, unfortunately. You see, if you go to Madras, it's interesting because many years back I did a production on Krishna and um, I had a Hussein line drawing which I used as a backdrop. And there, the, that Krishna didn't have a head. It was a line drawing of only the body. And the organizer said, sorry, you can't put this up. You know, this is, Krishna doesn't have a head. How can you put this up? So any artistic expression has to be understood in a context, in a very free engagement with it. But that's not happening in the conservative spaces where dance is seen. So I think uh, the, so expecting dancers who want to make a success of their careers, talking to them like this doesn't help because the so-called establishment is demanding a certain kind of dancing, which is very robotic, 
which is a certain uh, a module like you know uh, like amitabh bachchan's film film had four or five components which had to be there a formula it's becoming like that that kind of formula dancing is becoming the teaching is like that the performing is like that the audience wants that so how do we break this and you know and make dancers and audiences want something else is what i think my struggle has been throughout in my engagement as a teacher as a performer um, i've had to I, i've done productions which have always uh, kind of uh, questioned i've taken old pieces and put it in a context for today because i think contextualizing an old piece is very very important you can't really do a piece the way it was done many years back if we choose to do kabir today it has to be with the certain uh, understanding of what has happened yesterday and what watching the news it gives you that 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 is what is is, is there in your head when you are actually delivering it so i think all these uh, elements as an artist firstly the artist has to be a social being socio political being she is in society and she has to be aware this kind of saying that i do riyaz uh, you know 6 hours in my studio and i am not concerned with what is happening outside and this is celebrated and this is kind of said oh wow she is amazing isn't she she is a sadhika and she is that you know so you celebrate this uh this is important i'm not saying this is not important but if you don't understand society and empathize in so particularly covid has taught us this what has it taught us it has just paused us it has just told you that you can always not be in the third speed there are other speeds there is the second speed and the first speed you need to examine all the trikalas in life and you need to kind of slow down think move in words so i guess you know it's all a question of engagement as i as i said you need to you need to dialogue you need to talk you need to read i think a huge casualty in today's dancers is they don't read they don't read enough so they don't have a reference point in terms of um, uh, their own understanding of poetry literature mythology it's just little things that are that they are taught is all they are re uh, hashing and re you know uh, working on so where so many times children uh, you know young dancers ask me how do i increase my vocabulary of abhinaya how do i increase my vocabulary in i said there is no magic wand it is something that you need to to get your creative impulse from a line of poetry it can be one image that moves you and it, it a whole production is there i i used to teach in arpana kaur studio many years back and i used to be watching every day her work and her how her work used to be uh, put up in the evening in the studio and uh, you know one work i saw and i the whole imagery of a woman stepping out of a black space and i got my entire choreography and i i knew exactly what i wanted that was my beginning and source and i could do it in in just a week i was ready with a plan as to what i wanted to do so unless you again that is see we talk about interdisciplinary things but education is not interdisciplinary dance is not interdisciplinary then how does the person grow if you don't grow as a person your work is going to be a certain way so the growth has to come from different sources different elements that you pick up from so i think that is also very important to tell these youngsters all of you are here go to art shows listen to music read i think this uh, this just enriches you as a person and whatever you do it reflects everything reflects i think ranjana and geeta have said uh, everything that i would like to you know mention and oh by the way geeta we have one thing in common we were both mathematics graduates <laughs> which is like 100 years ago yeah you know they've already touched upon this and i would like to just briefly comment on how the artist needs to breathe the air of today i think that's really important because dance reflects life 
and it's not created in a vacuum. Kathak started off in a temple, into a court, into small principalities and in fact kotas where it survived during the British time. Then on a proscenium stage and now today in the bedroom, right? That is our current reality. I am in my bedroom talking to you. I'm in my bedroom or my living room doing a Zoom class or Zoom whatever. And how can I cut paste? I mean, I'm talking for myself and I don't judge anybody who is doing anything differently. But how do I cut paste a piece that I had danced seven months ago? You know, I, I, was on, I was going on a tour to the US and Canada and, and, uh, and Turkey. So that piece was being rehearsed with all, uh, with full vigor and full concentration and full emotions. And suddenly our lives were damned. Okay. So what happens to us? Do we cut paste that? Because of course, I'm, I mean, 55 years of dance. I've got a lot of repertoire that I can cut paste into this current reality. But like the rest of humanity, I have never been in this current reality. So how is that reality going to reflect what is my creative instinct? How do I reimagine my creative process? And I think that is very, very important. Look what is happening. I mean, what is our window to the world is what we are seeing um, on, on social media, on television, in, in, in newspapers that we read on, on our iPads. And you're seeing a crazy gamut of stuff, right? How can that not reflect I don't mean it doesn't have to be um, a, a piece that is only about, uh, you know, you're, I'm not an activist. I'm not going with a slogan and, and a, a, a placard because that's not my best way of communication. My best way to reach out to you is through my mind, but the movement of my mind, of my heart and my body. But how can that remain in a vacuum? So how, that is something I feel really strongly about, that my dance today has to reflect this. I have to find expansion within the four walls that I'm enclosed within. And I guess we've all said the same thing, that it has to reflect somewhere life. And you have to have the courage to let that reflect in it. It, it can be absorbed in many, many different ways. Like Gita said about a, a line painting, you know, or about, about seeing something and an entire production was revealed to her. So it's not tangible. It's not like janda leke ana. That's not what we do. But to be in a vacuum, it's just unthinkable that I would pick up a piece which was seven months ago, dancing and dance it right now. I, I just don't feel comfortable. It doesn't feel honest and truthful. And I think the post COVID is not going to be pre COVID days. Yeah. You know? And I think uh, many of us are, we are bottling up a lot and I hope something spectacular comes out of this. And I'm very hopeful that artists are going to really build back better because this is an opportunity for us to build back things in a better way. And I hope the post COVID um, comes out as a better period for performers and for audiences. Thank you so much, ma'am. That's a really insightful discussion. As Aditi ma'am has mentioned courtesans, so we have seen courtesans and their dasis and they used to be heads and they used to have that financial liberty. But today we see women struggling to maintain their freedom and to maintain that individualism. 
so do you think that somehow dance has shaped the roots of women empowerment and feminism which are now seemingly shaking i'm going to leave that answer to people who have researched it thoroughly um about the you know the whole movement the feminist movement from the devdasis or from the courtesans because um i don't know enough to be able to talk about it but i'm just going to give you an example of when you observe men and women dancers in kathak that i have uh, i have observed over the past so many years the male dancers in kathak 95% of them came from traditional families that had been dancing kathak it were those 5% and the 99% of women who are dancing kathak are the torch bearers of feminism because it is those 5% of men and those 99% of percent of female kathak dancers because women were not allowed to dance in in um in traditional families till till now their women were not uh, you know that, that expression was not open to them till now so these people have already broken taboos of their family and society dance a somehow is is associated with um the male gaze and i don't because we have always encouraged that or many 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 through lots of our um uh, you know our poetry and our and our visuals and all that has encouraged and society and kathak having gone through quotas where actually it survived because otherwise it would have been a extinct extinct dance form during the british days so these are the women dancers and the few male dancers who don't belong to traditional family who have broken taboos of family and society and i think i i would i would restrict my comment to that because i am not equipped to comment about the the history or and how actually the devdasi and the courtesans uh you know how how that whole process happened so i leave it to geeta and ranjana no neither am i equipped to talk about it from an academic angle because um, uh, that requires uh, a lot of research into what has happened but um, i would like to talk about uh, my own experience with my first teacher who was a devadasi because uh, i had almost um 14 years of uh, training under her and it was a fascinating story of hers where uh, she in the late 50s or yeah i think she married the man whom she loved who was um, a brahmin and she went on a world tour for dance and by the time she came back the husband had lost all his money and they had to shift to delhi with nothing to fall back on and uh, she started teaching in delhi and that's when i started learning from her and um, she was supporting him at that time and um, so when we say empowering what do we mean by empowering is it um is it uh, economic independence is it the 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 freedom to choose what are we talking when we say empowerment i think we need to also uh, uh, address that because uh, uh, today i think dance doesn't empower you in terms of money dance has no money whether it is a man dancing a woman dancing whatever it is it's professionally a very difficult space to be in particularly in covid days i think we realized it um uh, that uh, the uh, dance as a profession is very hard particularly if you are only choosing to perform unless you have other things to do dance becomes very difficult for uh, anybody to kind of um, survive only on dance um devadasis whatever i have understood 
whatever. I have had great uh, uh, um, interaction with the SILR community because my teachers were all from that community. Probably I was the last generation to learn from SILRs, from the teachers. After my generation, it was all from performing artists that, the, that uh, students learned. Never had the experience of the uh, Isabella community. Probably we were the last, you know, last generation. Because, um, and what was wonderful is their engagement was that they never, they taught for students and they taught completely different, the same piece would look completely different in four, with the four different pieces. So I think they had a different kind of, uh, um, and I understand that Devadasi was sidelined and the gurus came forward and, you know, visually, initially the, you know, the Natavarars used to be at the back and the Devadasi used to dance in front and suddenly the Devadasi vanished and the Natavarar became the focus of, uh, so the patriarchy just took over and uh, there are lots of things that, uh, so when, when we talk about empowering, I don't think dance Stage is very, very empowering. Yes, when you are on stage, you feel you own the world. And whether it's a man dancing or a woman dancing, that space is very special. There's no doubt about it. And we all miss it right now. So um, I think um, uh, Ranjana would be the right person to talk about it, about how dance can empower or how the Devadasi movement, how far it has kind of, uh, uh, as a historical perspective, what it has been. But my interaction with uh, the women are very strong women, women, but have gone through a lot because that was the phase when they were subjected to a lot. So I think the scars are still there and the debate is on and it will continue. It, there is no conclusive thing to these things because we are trying to see history uh, at a particular time. History cannot be viewed with just this one aspect. At the same time, there were multiple things happening. What happened to the female musicians? What was happening to them in, 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 uh, in uh, Madras at that time? So I think there's so many multiple things happening. History cannot be viewed when you talk about the Devadasi. It's not just the Devadasi. What is happening all around is equally important as for how it is impacting uh, the Devadasi and her uh, um, life. So over to Ranjana. I think she can throw light on this. Thank you. I again like to say that I'm in no way and uh, I've, I've done some reading but I'm not an authority and I'm definitely not the, uh, uh, I cannot claim to be speaking for uh, uh, courtesan communities at all. I'm speaking as an outsider, as a uh, 21st century dancer. Um, I, I, when I think of, when I think of these questions about dance as empowerment, I cannot help but think of, um, uh, again, coming back to what's happening right now and to, I recently came across, uh, some posts on social media that, um, uh, uh, where people were asking, uh, some friends of mine asking people to amplify Dalit voices, uh, and to, uh, and to just make them heard and make them heard not just by sharing posts but also by like literally like toppling the whole facebook algorithm because as you see i'm also i'm also following the us uh, presidential elections uh, a little bit and uh, there is a very concerted way in which uh, a certain kind of information often misinformation gets more highlighted than things you need to know which is why, I mean, there are still people, for instance, saying, oh, the pandemic is not real. Uh, oh, uh, it's all a hoax. But there is a way in which that information is allowed to continue spreading. And that's because we're not hearing counter views uh, loudly enough. And, uh, and similarly, I think with the, uh, uh, there was also, uh, many of you may have, uh, come across, there was a conversation around the very use of the term Devadasi on social media some months ago, where uh, a, there was an excerpt of a TED talk where a dancer had used the term and uh, someone from uh, a courtesan community responded mm -hmm. saying that that was not the term by which they preferred to identify any longer. 
So, uh, so I feel like uh, what Gita said that these things keep changing and that it's important to remain alive to uh, uh, what they mean in the moment and, uh, and what they mean in the moment is not just defined by uh, the people viewing them. So we, as someone from the outside commenting on that community, but they can choose to self-determine at any moment and say, this is this is how I choose to identify. This is how I choose to be represented in this moment, and uh, and I feel like that's it's important to recognize that that uh, that ability to self to identify to uh, whether it is uh, whether it's saying I'm you know I identify as a woman I identify as queer or even uh, and and even with the trans bill for instance last year. One of the biggest issues with the bill was that it actually took away the uh, it took away the uh, person's right to self-identify because now you were forced to go through this medical procedure to identify as trans. From what I I may be wrong, but this is what I remember of the uh, conversations around the bill. So so as long as we hold on to we, uh, I think empowerment is also about recognizing that. Everyone has the right to uh, identify and represent and speak for themselves and that it cannot just be a finite, a small group of people uh, who are usually upper caste, uh, upper class and urban speaking for everyone else. And uh, somewhere empowerment is making sure that there are more voices. So if you have the privilege, if you have the... Uh, if you have the reach, it's also about making sure that the other voices that don't have these uh, uh, same privileges get as much bandwidth as uh, you do. Thank you so much, ma'am. Moving on to the next question. Uh, it is the emotive power of Indian dance that really stirs the soul of Western audience uh, as different from dance forms. They themselves are familiar with so can you throw some light on how the Indian diaspora and the Western audience perceive Indian classical dance traditions since you all have been widely accepted internationally Indian dancers? So how, what are, how Western audience perceive Indian classical dance? Yeah, I think, you know, it's sometimes it's uh, important to realize that the movement of our mind, bodies and hearts and dance is a universal language. Um, and I don't think it's a sense of, I don't like to talk about connecting it to any form of religion, but connecting it to a sense of humanity, love, and that brings in a sense of um, connection to la our life, to the nature around us. Um, and I think Western and Indian audience, yes, because if at times you are talking about very specific um, uh, uh, narratives which are steeped in the history and the geography of a particular region. And I think it depends on each dancer who performs abroad um, and to a mainly non-Indian audience abroad of how one is able to reach across this sense of history and geography and how you're able to take that without explanation because of course explanation then then gives you the whole narrative but that is a challenge or how do you weave in um communities that may not uh, you know and across the globe uh, which are which are um not exactly in tune with your own uh, know about your own um history and geography where the dance style comes from so it's i think it's about the artistry uh, of the performer, of how she or he is able to take that across and how transcend uh, so that 
the raw narrative, the raw emotion, uh, which is universal, reaches across. Uh, I think in the 70s and the 80s, uh, uh, you know, these classical dance forms were seen um, as soft power by India. And, um, uh, you know, Western audiences loved this exotic, uh, beautifully dressed uh, dancer on stage and um, found it, um, you know, the, uh, the East became the flavor and everybody looked at these dances as um, um, beautiful and wonderful and all that. But I think we've moved on. I think today it's more as somebody had written in an article that now no longer dance is not the soft power. It is uh, chicken tikka and Bollywood, which is soft power. <laughs> so, um, so I feel that um, um, when we take uh, our productions uh, outside of India, um, I think the discipline of firstly watching a performance strikes you. That's so fascinating when you go out. The way they, they, they commit an evening and they just stay with you in the narrative and, and openly. They don't understand the mythology. They don't understand anything. But they catch the essence of what you're trying to see. I mean, show. So I think they, they perceive it in a very, very different way today. And um, of course, we as dancers have also uh, understood that lighting is important, presentation is important. I think it's become much more uh, professional in terms of what we say. Uh, it's interesting when I went to Poland and I did one very, very, um, um, you know, complicated Tamil composition uh, from um, uh, on Shiva. It was a Kauthum by Gangamuthu Natuvanar. And, um, you know, a Polish man said, isn't this Thiruvalayadal um, uh, from Thiruvalayadal? And there was a Tamil study uh, department and he knew much more of Tamil than I knew. So we can't underestimate any audience. You see, uh, we feel they don't, uh, they won't be able to catch this without an explanation. They do. You have to have faith and you have to have complete conviction in what you are saying. If Balama in 1940s could go and mesmerize everybody with Krishnani Vegane Baro, who knew nothing about, nobody knew anything about anything. And she did a Mohamana Varnam, which is completely Kate um, classical Indian dance. And she moved everybody and she had a standing ovation. So I feel, you know, it's, it's the artistry. It is the craft. It is the, 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 the way you say it. I think that is the most important. I don't believe in creating separate work for the West that works in the West. I don't subscribe to that at all. I think you as an artist have to be honest um, and you have to do follow your instinct and make that work wherever you dance. So I feel that uh, is my take on uh, foreign audiences. As far as the diaspora is concerned, Yes, I think they're sometimes frozen in time. The Indians who went there in the 60s and the you know, uh, 50s, they, they went as professionals but gave up everything and started teaching dance and they have institutions and huge setups there. So I think that uh, they are also now realizing that dance has moved in India and dance is kind of uh, you know, traveled and they keep visiting India and trying to take inputs into it. But that is still, I think, a little difficult because they learn dance for very different reasons, which I wouldn't want to get into now at this point in time. <laughs> uh, I'd like to continue where, uh, uh, with something Geeta said about uh, being frozen in time, but also uh, extend this discussion to contemporary dance. Um, in recent times, when um, especially when there are, uh, say, uh, uh, people from the curators or uh, producers from the West looking at work made in India. Uh, there's this, and especially with sort of contemporary dance where there isn't necessarily an identifiable, say, a costume, an idiom to, uh, uh, to uh, recognize as Indian. Things keep changing based on the nature of the work. 
uh, there's this constant pressure to be, but what's Indian about this work? You know, what's, uh, if you're wearing pants, if you're uh, doing movement that doesn't necessarily look like a classical dance, what's Indian about it? And I feel like some, that also comes from, it's important to remember that when we talk about the West, uh, most of the non-West has, uh, uh, has been a colony of some uh, nation in the West at some point in time. And uh, the, uh, of course, there is, a, I mean, there is this uh, group of the diaspora that has migrated there earlier and subscribes to views that are frozen in time. But in general, people, audiences, presenters in those countries, especially with contemporary dance, also often have the expectation that that will fit their picture of what their former colony looked like. So Indian then becomes a very... Uh, restricted set of ideas that uh, that we perhaps don't subscribe to any longer because it is not part of our reality. So I feel like somewhere we also we or we should also constantly remember that this exists and constantly remember to question it and resist it because uh, how a dancer I mean it it you could do everything I mean from the sort of you know you could wear wear uh, the expected dance costume and dance or you could be wearing shorts and working in contemporary dance. And all those forms, all those possibilities, they're all Indian. And if you identify as Indian really, so it's not, uh, I feel like these debates about identity again cross over into much of what we're dealing with in society, but really uh, how you identify is up to you. And, uh, Within, uh, in taking your work out to audiences, I think there constantly needs to be a conversation about uh, that possibility of identity being fluid. Could I just come in for one second? Because I think this is such an important thing. It's been a dream of mine to be presented at festivals that are not to do with Asia-centric or India-centric or East-centric. No, you are there because they are curating what they consider the best in dance. Mainstream. Whether it, mainstream. Yeah, mainstream best in dance. Whether it is Kathak or contemporary or from whichever region in the world it is coming from. So these kind of things tend to put you into little compartments because very often in the West and these mainstream festivals tick a box. Oh, one brown company has come. So now, okay, so now this company is another brown company and you know, that will come maybe two years later. So that is something one has to constantly be aware of and, and not be compartmentalized and always say, no, I'm here because there is a, something I want to say in the world of dance. Doesn't matter if I'm from Timbuktu or India or wherever. And I think that is very important. Thank you so much. The whole aura has become enriched by our panelists' learned experiences. We wish to learn more from them, but due to time constraints, moving on to the last segment, I would request the audience to put in their questions in the chat box. And I would like to know what values would you like the next generation to have so that the classical dance forms can become a way towards a better life and towards the liberation we seek today. Is that a question? Ma'am, the values that uh, you think that next generation should have to so that classical dance forms can become a way towards a better life oh, i mean um, classical dance um, to make people understand classical dance i think the education process right from the beginning needs to integrate the arts in schools i think that's where the story begins Suddenly, you can't kind of inculcate a sudden liking for something. So uh, schools, the new education policy is kind of talking about a lot of things, but we don't know how much is really going to happen. 
and um, this is all just suggestion and how much people are going to and the problem is i i i'm passionate about uh, integrating arts in the school so i do understand i've been part of the curriculum framework for many of the schools and the curriculum framework for ncrt so uh, the problem is not the curriculum the problem is the trainers you know the trainers need to be of a certain kind who have interdisciplinary understanding and who can teach in the schools and see how the artistic temperament and the creativity can be inculcated right from the beginning and and you won't see it as extra curricular activities <laughs> you have to see it very much as co curricular activities which are very very important right now it's seen as something if you do it it's okay if you don't do it even better very good so i think uh, we don't understand how to integrate the arts in schools this is a huge issue that we will need to address in the coming years if we need to have what you say the classical arts being part of life in india and values coming out of it and a certain tradition being carried forward with dignity and with uh, professional possibilities so i think that we have to bring it center stage and the only way to do it i feel is through education there is no other way that you can grapple with this um, at the top you know you have to go down and start creating fresh rasikas and sahridays okay shall i go ranjana okay no i i i absolutely agree and i think that it's not only about dance because values in your life and in your society reflect in your dance so all of us i think today and in many countries in the world have to really relook at our values really rethink what has become of us as a society rethink how uh, how we are encouraging divisive tactics and divisive uh, forces in many countries and how we have become in a way the living dead so unless one rethinks relooks re reexamines and as geeta very rightly said it has to start this whole system of values of of non violence of inclusivity of of um, humility of of love um of building bridges has to start from your school level so dance is a small part of that building bridge um i mean uh, i guess the the one thing i'd like to say in response to your question is um just whatever it is keep keep uh whatever you're learning keep thinking keep asking questions and never never take anything as given or as the absolute truth everything has to be questioned and i wanted to say like what you were saying about uh learning from this conversation i i felt like this is a question i'd actually like to hear responses from uh the from all of you about because uh learning you uh, Uh, you have to constantly remember is also it's a two way process it's not the transmission of knowledge is never just from one person to another but you're also learning from uh, the person you you you're teaching at at a certain moment for example so really so take even in this conversation like it's it's uh, completely okay to question things that we're saying or uh, to not agree with something or to want to know more about something so this is a question i'd actually turn back at all of you and say what meaning does uh, dance uh, allow uh, to emerge in your life very rightly said ma'am thank you so much Uh, i would like prashant to unmute himself and proceed with the questions of audience prashant hello everyone 
thank you panelists for this interesting discussion so due to time constraint we take only two questions uh, the first question is for uh, ranjana ma'am the question is from shrinidhi she asks dance is so therapeutic powerful beautiful and life affirming still why there is so much opposition towards it why people don't support dance and especially dance as a profession um i i'd like to think that that is slowly changing and uh, uh, and one of the major reasons like i feel like especially in the classical uh, in in classical dance and music uh there has been a way in which post independence the people who uh, many of the people who studied dance uh did not necessarily uh this was not always the case and this is of course not true of all dancers but many of them did not necessarily depend on dance as a livelihood so uh as a result of that dance uh dance was something you could afford to do just for pleasure so uh uh so that then that meant that it was not it was not something you earned your rent from again like i said this is not true of everyone and there are definitely people who do including people right here who do make a living from dance specifically but because of that there's also this and and that's also spawned a whole culture of say festivals that people uh, for festivals that will not pay dancers to perform or uh, festivals that will ask dancers to perform for exposure because it's because it's okay it's understood that yes you know you will you will train and you will go to class dance class for 10 years 15 years 20 years at your own expense uh, you will pay for your costumes you will pay for your music uh, you will play, pay for musicians to perform with you but uh, the last person who is paid i mean sometimes when i um, when i have performed solo like the ridiculousness of it even when i am getting paid is that everyone else is everyone the person doing the lights the musicians everyone else is getting paid but i'm uh, even if the money comes to me i'm not able to pay myself so somewhere this idea of what needs to change is that the arts don't exist just for pleasure they give pleasure sure that's completely okay but uh, we need to recognize that to uh, to make work to keep dancing to keep uh, it also it, it is i mean while i do this i'm sitting like i have to you know i have to pay for that fridge i have to pay for uh, pay to rent this house so i'm not an ethereal divine being i'm a being with real needs i'm a being that has digestive functions i you know so i have i think the moment we which is why it's necessarily necessary to tie dance down to society and say we're all human beings we're not apsaras who don't need uh, rent and food and uh, uh, coffee we all need these things also i think karanjana i would like and aditi would like to add here that you know uh, you know when people are calling for calling me up for live performances now um, the question of payment doesn't even arise i had one very well known musician who called me up the other day and said that um, we have stopped performing music because bahut besura sound karta hai music mein and the next breath he said that why don't you perform half an hour for us for free of course uh, because we are generating content for our uh, youtube channel so i think uh, as senior dancers i think we have a great responsibility now of um, um, you know kind of shaping the way forward and really putting up or down and saying you know enough is enough this this sense of entitlement of just asking for free uh, everything is shared free knowledge is shared free content is shared free you know performances are shared free and uh, people think this is the way to do it now in the pandemic no but then that is going to really damage the already damaged profession of dance so i think we need to tread very carefully here and not really feel left out of some imaginary race that everybody thinks they are going to be left out if they don't uh, perform for free so i completely agree with ranjana that uh, monetizing arts is i think so so important 
and um, and to make sure that you pay enough that the dancer has something left for herself after you know giving everybody around so as as i always say that you know my musicians would be buying their fourth home and i would be selling my existing house so <laughs> this is a joke ongoing joke <laughs> so this is true of dancers it's a uh, Passion is one thing, but you need your kitchen fires burning. Sorry, is is this a question to all three of us? Should I, uh, as we chat right now, there is a fundraiser going on, um, right now online, by four hundred and fifty artists to collect funds. very early in the pandemic uh, my dance company and me decided no more free content it was difficult but we said enough is enough because as both geeta and ranjana said we can't there is we can't live on fresh air love you know i mean we do have to buy the fridge or or pay the rent and so if you see and it has come into focus during the pandemic right now really into focus because are we a community is there a community of dancers or musicians or artisans or or the rasai maker or the or the potter is that a community because it's not recognized or if you look at the art scenario in india it falls within some eight or nine different ministries so you run from pillar to post trying to get some kind of funding which has been completely uh, there has been no thought given to it that how are these people surviving not only the main artists but all the accompanists all the stage hands the tailor the costume maker what is happening to them they are dying and with them the art is dying so you can't make this sort of people the ambassadors of your unique culture and then expect them to survive this it's ridiculous and in fact all the fundraisers that have happened have happened by artists for artists it's it's incredible that what has kept us alive these last 7 months close to our humanity is music our you know our favorite our films to go to our music to listen to our favorite dancer to engage with so much of the arts are the a beautiful book of poetry to read and then we are not even recognized as a community it's it's like oh really they need it they need money so it's it's um it's absolutely disgusting and it's absolutely um unacceptable because i am in a privileged position to sit here and chat to you but there are thousands of people who are not and forget it's going to have another class system you know the ones who have internet and the ones who don't we are very of course we have all of us adapted to the internet zoom this that and we are all reimagining dance but bhai we can reimagine dance because we have internet what about the thousands of artists the folk artists the tribal artists the one who sang in the weddings the the people who made little pots and you know artisans who have no no access to internet so it it's not an acceptable place and we all have to stand up and say this isn't on you are not going to watch something free in fact that should be the opinion of the audience also we will pay 5 rupees but we'll pay for it thank you adepi ma'am geeta ma'am due to time constraints we can't take all the questions we are really sorry we will try to answer your questions via mail thank you all i'd like to ask isha to unmute herself and start thank you prashant i extend a heartfelt thank you to this the distinguished bench of panelists for enlightening us with their sheer knowledge on the subject and widening the dimensions of the for the art of dance for us thank you so much dance dance has no barriers it is an art 
that everyone can feel and enjoy from their heart. Indian classical music and dance are not just for entertainment. They are designed to elevate your soul. And we are glad to have with us Ms. Shimran Zaman, a classical Odissi dancer. She has been training in this dance form from the tender age of six under the late Guru Shri Pravash Kumar Mohanati and Odissi Guru Shri Pitambar Biswal. She has received many prestigious awards to her credit like Nritya Shiromani Samman, Odissi Pratibha Award, National Kalaratna Award, to name a few. She recently performed in the second ABU Festival 2019 held at Taj Palace, New Delhi. She has also been felicitated by the Intellects New Delhi with Youth Brand Ambassador Awards for the promotion and popularization of Odia culture through Odissi dance. She has established her own institution, Lasvian, in New Delhi, which emphasizes the promotion and propagation of Indian art, culture, and heritage. I am delighted to invite and welcome Ms. Shimran Zaman to present her beautiful dance performance before us and set a visual treat for each one of us. Thank you so much. Namaskar, Pranam. First of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the esteemed dignitaries present today. Thank you so much for the informative insight that you gave us to give, give to us the younger generation. Thank you so much, ma'am. Today I'll be performing Pallavi. Pallavi comes in the fourth stage of Odissi repertoire. Pallavi is basically a Nitta piece full of lyrical and graceful movements. Pallavi is usually named after the raga on which it is based upon. I'll be presenting Pallavi set to Tal, Tal Malika and Rag Anandavir. Ah, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you so much, Simran, for this mesmerizing and uh, flawless performance. It's, it's been a privilege and an honor to watch you perform live. Thank you so much. Also, I thank... Sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry. Also, I would like to thank Adhita, the Indian Dance Society of Hindu College, for considering me and giving me an opportunity to present my piece in front of such esteemed dignitaries. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, ma'am, Geeta ma'am, Aditi ma'am, Nanjana ma'am, for being here with us today. Thank you so much. I have to thank the Hindu College because uh, uh, having such a serious discussion on dance um, 
by a DU college. I think I'm very, very happy. And um, uh, uh, this requires uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, initiative on your part to uh, host such an event. And congratulations to all of you, the Hindu College uh, Dance Society and um, Trita and continue the good work and uh, enjoyed being on the panel with Ranjana and Aditi whom uh, we all haven't met in a long time now. So it, it really felt good to have uh, this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Shimran. That was wonderful. Thank you for performing for us and thank you uh, Adrita and the, you know, the Hindu College Dance Society for inviting us. It was wonderful to share views um, and learn from both Ranjana and Geeta. And I wish we had some more time to take your questions and see, uh, you know, what we could learn from you. But all, there's always another day and hope to see you all soon and all the very, very best. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining in, ma'am. Thank you so much, everyone. I just wanted to say I really, uh, I really enjoyed seeing so many people and sort of also seeing all the questions that we unfortunately couldn't take on. But, uh, but please keep asking these questions anyway. And I hope that we may, we'll find other opportunities to also respond to them, communicate about them on uh, social media for the moment. Thank you. Uh, and thank you both Aditi and Geeta. I loved hearing from you and um, and just hearing your responses to these questions. Thank you so much for your valuable words, ma'am. And thank you so much for coming in and having this much insightful discussion. Uh, Dijana, I would like to take uh, hand over the mic to Dijana so that uh, she could have before we moving towards a word of thanks, uh, Cultural Root Foundations have few words to speak. So you can speak right now. Uh, namaskar and good evening. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Mohit Dubhal and I'm the founder of this NGO called Culture Roots Foundation. Uh, we have been working to promote Indian culture of performing arts in India and uh, worldwide. We are trying our best. We are students as well. And we are trying to create more audience for Indian classical art forms. And uh, I feel so fortunate to be here right now, especially when uh, Geeta Ma'am is here. Uh, she doesn't remember me, but let me tell you that in 2011, you gave me the best vocalist prize in Zakir Hussain Delhi College. <laughs> and uh, I am uh, associated with Gandhar Mahavidyalay from uh, 16, 17 years now. And right now preparing for PhD in music. And we have this uh, NGO and we try to work with Indian classical art forms. But till now we have been working with musicians and uh, Indian classical choirs. But now as I have more friends and more, uh, you know, uh, familiar people in uh, the dance fraternity, I hope we'll do mm -hmm. more with uh, dancers as well. And uh, I feel so fortunate. Thank you so much. Uh, to the dance society of hindu college they have been very very active in terms of uh, you know doing something for indian classical art forms when whenever it is about the indian classical art form they are you know very enthusiast i have seen this from uh, like past four years now and uh, thank you so much for letting me in and letting me hear this conversation I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So um, I'm here to thank all of you for making this session so beautiful and special. First of all, I would like to thank each and every audience who came and spent their valuable time with us. The urge to know about dance is so admirable. Once again, on the behalf of Adrida, thank you all for joining us. The real pulse of our event, Isar Iraqs, is our panelist. We are so lucky and privileged to hear from you all. Firstly, I would like to thank Patmasri Gida Chandranman for joining us. You spoke from your great experience 
that dance it is not only about body it is all about soul and also the need to make the audience think thank you for sharing your valuable words with us next i would like to express our sincere thanks to shrimati aditi mangaldas thank you for speaking about the need to talk about sexuality and a lot of areas you covered like ageism in dance and the fitness should be keep with mind and body thank you for joining us next i extend our gratitude towards ranjana dave ma'am the knowledge you have in this discipline is incredible and you talk about the importance of the access of dance to all classes of the society also the need for using as uh, arts for the uh, for one's right and protest protesting and um, thank you ma'am for joining us next the main highlight of our event is simran saman thank you simran for your graceful odc performance we absolutely loved it i would like to mention our media partners quickly cultural root foundation those who are live streaming our, our event on youtube other partners du beat du connections and delhi university officials thank you for associating with us lastly i am thanking all the home members of padrida especially the union thank you for working day and night to make this event a big success i can't end without mentioning our president arvada thank you arvada for leading us in the right way once again thank you all i wish there would be more and more platforms where we could talk about dance and people thank you thank you ma'am thank you thank you everyone